Okay, good morning everybody and uh, welcome to this, our uh, next speaker in the series, which is Dr. Jian Ying Wu. Uh, she has a very, very interesting career. She is one of the people who have been working on machine learning and AI for very long time. And in the early days, she was working at uh, uh, AT&T and then at Avaya, doing mostly academic research there. And uh, it was bothering her that she's not making that much impact and she wants to make the real thing. So she decided to go to IBM. And uh, at IBM, she started working on particularly on computational health related issues. Uh, she became a fellow there and uh, she is, started leading the global projects in healthcare area there. So now she is directing computational health in almost uh, all uh, IBM research, uh, particularly in uh, Yorktown Heights and Cambridge, people are uh, directly reporting to her, but out of the nine labs, I think almost all of them uh, have research going on in this area and they are working in there. Uh, she started at a time when uh, ESR systems were just becoming popular and she wanted to start with uh, applying machine learning AI techniques to those things there. But then she, being eager to make impact, she started looking at all kinds of data that uh, she will help us with here. The uh, good thing is she understands the global healthcare systems. So she can address issues all over the world. But her discussion here today is going to be mostly focused on technical side. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, thank you very much. All right. So, yeah, so I work at IBM Research. I, I lead the Center for Computational Health there. I also more recently have the role of uh, global science lead leader for AI for healthcare. So in that role, I coordinate our worldwide research initiatives on accelerating the impact of AI on healthcare. So as Ramesh mentioned, we are clearly at a very exciting time for computational health in general and AI for healthcare in particular. And, and so I'm very, very uh, excited to have this opportunity to come here to share with you our approach, what we have learned, and also to learn from all of you. So in today's presentation, I'm, I'm going to start with just giving you a very high le level overview of our uh, healthcare life sciences research organization at IBM, just to give you a sense of the breadth and depth of IBM's investment in healthcare related research. I will then share with you our specific approach to computational health, some of the principles that we have been following that we believe really uh, set us apart. And then I'll give you some examples where we have developed some advanced computational methods and apply them to various use cases in the healthcare ecosystem. All right, so IBM Research is a large global organization. We have over 3,000 researchers uh, that spread over uh, 12 labs around the world. Uh, and uh, for nine out of these 12 global labs, there is healthcare and life sciences related research efforts. Uh, and, and with uh, uh, altogether over 350 researchers, right, uh, all working in healthcare life sciences domain. And our portfolio in healthcare life sciences research uh, is very diverse as you see here and can be organized into these three distinct but also connected themes. Uh, in computational biology, we focus on really driving discoveries of the mechanisms of disease and intervention through um, modeling and analysis of the uh, foundational biological processes. And then the middle pillar, uh, computational health, is where we focus on improving the outcomes for the individuals as well as populations through advanced um, computational methods that's applied to diverse data collected throughout the health ecosystem. And then the last theme, which is device and technology or health I IoT, is where we leverage IBM's expertise in specialized hardware as well as capabilities in edge as well as cloud computing 
to uh, try to come up with novel ways of uh, collecting, aggregating, understanding, as well as feedback health signals uh, from individuals and for individuals, but in the context of their living environments. So as you can see, this is a very broad portfolio, and as Ramesh mentioned, I am responsible for the computational health pillar, uh, where we have uh, over 100 researchers, again, uh, distributed over nine global labs. So, and that's what I'm going to focus on in my talk today, is the computational health aspect of our um, research activity. And so what is computational health? So in our view, computational health is really all about enabling the journey from data to impact. Right? So the data, we're talking about all the data of many, many different types collected from many different sources and potentially from different institutions for any encounter in the health ecosystem. Right? And then the challenge is then how do you extract insights from this data but then to be able to eventually apply it to the individual to improve the health outcome. And there are clearly many, many challenges in this journey. Uh, from the computational angle, we organize these challenges into these three pillars. On the left-hand side, you have pattern extraction. This is about preparing the data for downstream analysis. Right? So starting from pre-processing, and that's to address the inherent deficiencies in data, you know, noise, bias, and sparsity, et cetera. Uh, and then feature engineering is to be able to extract from the raw input data of these many different types features that have more clinical meaning. Uh, and then feature selection, as you know, machine learning people are all very familiar with this, to identify out of those you know, hundreds of thousands of, of features to identify the ones that are actually relevant for a particular model that's being developed. Now with model, modern machine learning approaches, feature engineering and feature selection are now increasingly combined into, the, into this one step that's often referred to as feature embedding. And in healthcare space, we refer to it as, as uh, pheno embedding. So that's the process where you map from raw data, again, of these many, many different types, to a feature space where machine learning models can operate upon. But the important thing is you need to do this mapping in a way that is, number one, clinically meaningful. Right. You want the features that you generate to be to have actual clinical meaning. And number two, they need to be semantically consistent, meaning no matter whether these features are extracted from data from whichever source or whichever institution, in the end, they should mean the same thing. And this is actually very difficult to do, uh, but it's very important in order to ensure model interoperability and, and therefore uh, usability of these models that we develop. So that's one area that we actually have been putting a lot of effort. And then moving to the middle pillar, this is the central pillar. Uh, it's the insights generation. And this is where we have been working on a lot of uh, you know, efforts on coming up with innovative uh, methods to address different use cases in healthcare space. And one really key principle we have learned over the years working with domain experts is that we cannot attempt to uh, address all the problems with one hammer, even if that hammer is deep learning. Um, but rather, we need to really work very closely with domain experts and be very, very careful in uh, selecting in the, in the model, be very, very purposeful in the model selection process and to identify which particular method to choose to use to address the specific use case. So what you see here are some of the types of models that we have come to uh, understand as important, as being important in addressing different use cases in healthcare domain. Um, precision cohort is about coming up with analytic models that would allow you to identify patients who are similar to each other within a specific clinical context, right? So that we can really leverage these large amount of data of many, many different types of cohorts to be able to identify the cohort that's most relevant for a particular patient or a particular type of patient in order to make that model more relevant. Um, Multitask learning is, is where we uh, need to build models to address this very common uh, uh, phenomenon, if you will, that in healthcare space, very often the risks that you're predicting out, or the outcomes that you're predicting are not independent of each other. Right? So, so then the idea here is we need to leverage the multitask learning, machine learning framework to build models that, that are able to leverage the interconnections between these different risks and outcomes as well as factors that's behind them. 
uh, longitudinal modeling is very important, again, a very, very important aspect in, in uh, building healthcare models because the progression of disease and health conditions are by nature longitudinal. And so we really need to go beyond just making building models that's making point in time predictions, but rather actually build models that, that can truly capture the temporal progression of disease conditions and characterization of different stages of disease so that we can provide more actionable insights even before it becomes uh, symptomatic. Right? Uh, interpretable model is another area that's very important for machine learning models in general, but for healthcare it's again particularly important for regulatory as well as adoption reasons. And here we have been uh, looking at this or trying to address this, this, uh, um, this this requirement from two different angles. One is to look at uh, building tools, particularly visual analytics tools, that can be used to interrogate uh, models, such as deep learning models that are more black box in nature, to help us better understand and explain and interpret that model. The other angle, uh, equally important, and one could argue is even more important, is to look at alternative models that are inherently more in in interpretable. Right? So models that are more generative, models that are network and graph based, right? Uh, and another direction that we are really actively pursuing is to leverage the fact that we have a world-class computational biology team sitting next to our computational health team to look at ways to perform this notion of hybrid modeling, meaning how do we combine machine learning models with mechanistic uh, you know, uh, computational biology models so that we can come up with models that's the most you know, ultimately interpretable model because we can then tie the patterns that we learn from uh, machine learning to actual uh, mechanisms of, of disease or health conditions. Uh, causal inference is, is uh, really at the heart of being able to make trustworthy effect estimates from observational data, right? So we need to do this if we want to go beyond relying solely on randomized clinical trial results to guide our practice, uh, and, and we need to make that extension because uh, clinical trials, as robust as those results are, have limitations. Number one, uh, trials that are not always possible for various reasons, sometimes it's economical, sometimes it's logistic and ethical concerns. And number two, even when the trials are conducted, what these trials teach us are average effects that's estimated from a predefined population that may or may not match the patient that you have at hand in the real world setting. Right? So in order to actually leverage this large amount of observational data we have now available to come up with more personalized insights for a more real world setting, we need to come up with methods that can leverage the observational data and properly address the confounding factors which are inevitable for uh, uh, observational data because these are not experimental data, not by, by design, right? So by nature, there will be bias, there will be confounding factors, and therefore you need to have methods that can properly <coughs> address that. Um, and uh, beyond that, we also need to make these methods more robust and more scalable for real world settings. And we need to be able to estimate effects not just for single treatments, but also combinations of treatments and sequences of treatments, which again are very common in real world settings, but are very rarely tested in clinical trials. Right. So, so these are areas uh, where we believe uh, there are, uh, you know, there needs to be a lot of efforts in de designing these many different methods for insights generation. Again, our goal is to drive insights that are more actionable. Um, However, if you think about it, yes, we are trying to get actionable insights, but none of these matters if no action is taken, right? So this last pillar is about that action, is, is how do you actually take that insight to apply it to the individuals to actually drive better outcome? And, and again, there are two angles to this, this challenge. One is to how do we take these insights to improve the delivery of care itself? So that's all about uh, what do you see in the, in the first box, performance intelligence and optimization, how do you take these insights to actually uh, change the delivery model to, to, to uh, improve the delivery of, of care itself. But the other angle, equally important, is the engagement side, which is how do we leverage the data and machine learning methods 
to empower the individuals, to make them uh, not just passive receivers of care, which is the traditional model, but becoming more active participants of the management of their own health. Right? So, so in order to do that, we need to develop machine, le machine learning models that can learn behavior patterns from all these longitudinal observational data, but also to be able to put these learning algorithms in the context of well-established behavior change theory right, so that we can have a framework in which uh, we can then systematically uh, evaluate and test uh, different types of behavior interventions to come up with ways to, to uh, um, service uh, these interventions in a personalized manner. So for both of these angles, another very important uh, aspect is, is to uh, evaluate and measure the performance of the models in a meaningful way. Right? So we need to go beyond just looking at AUCs and traditional measures like readmission rates, but to look at also operational measures as well as patient-generated outcomes. Uh, and very importantly as well, we need to have ways to evaluate the reliability of these models when they're deployed in real world settings, as well as to guard against bias, right? That's, uh, that, that's inherent in the data again, um, but can be reflected in the model. So, and if you look at the bar underneath, across all of these uh, methods that can enable federated and privacy preserving learning is very important to be able to address the situations where data can be shared but cannot be centralized, which again is very common in healthcare space, so how do we build models that can allow us to learn from this kind of uh, somewhat more restricted setting. All right, so that's our vision for computational health, and this next page gives you a high-level summary of, of what we have been doing in the last you know, few years in terms of driving towards this vision. Again, on the left-hand side are the different types of data that's coming from the health ecosystem, and on the right-hand side are some examples of the types of machine learning models that we have, built, we have been building to address the different use cases in healthcare space and in the center, in the circle, you see the list of disease conditions that we have touched on in a lot of these efforts. So what I'm going to do next is to give you some examples of uh, some of these uh, uh, specific methods that we have been working on applying to specific use cases in the healthcare domain. Uh, because of the time constraint, I will not be able to go dive deep in any of these, but as you will see, we have publications for every example that I give, and so I'll be very happy to point you to these publications and have offline discussions on anything that you're interested in. Okay, so the first area I want to touch on is patient similarity analytics. So this is where, for the purpose of coming up with precision cohorts, right? So the idea is to build mathematical models that can allow us to assess patient similarity for a given clinical context. And so the challenge here from the computational angle is number one, because we want to go beyond you know, the traditional dimensions of just age, gender, and perhaps some comorbidities, we want to instead take into consideration all the data of many, many different types that we have about a patient. So the first challenge is this becomes a very high dimensional space. So how do you define similarity in, a, in this high dimensional space is by itself a very challenging mathematical problem. And number two is the notion of patient similarity is context dependent. So what factors are important when you're evaluating different treatments for hyperlipidemia, for example, may be completely different from when you are looking at different chemotherapies. So to address these challenges, what we have done is to leverage this form of machine learning called supervised metric learning, to design methods that can uh, allow us to learn automatically from data, right, out of these you know, hundreds of thousands of factors, which ones are actually important for a specific clinical condition, a specific outcome that we're interested in, and how should these factors be weighted to come up with that final distance measure, right? So by doing this, we essentially can generate uh, customized distance metrics that we can use to evaluate patient similarity for different clinical settings. And as you can see from the list of public, uh, publications, this is one of the first areas that we worked in, uh, in uh, when we ventured into healthcare domain, and we have built on that over the years. And this sort of notion of, of patient similarity and precision cohort can be used to support many downstream analysis, and I'll give you some examples 
And you um, do this analysis based on ESR data? Yeah, or no? ESR data to start with. Yeah. I mean, we are now starting to incorporate other data as mm. well, but in the beginning it was EMR data. So one area we have applied this uh, patient similarity analytics is to combine this with a uh, large-scale predictive modeling platform that we have built for specifically uh, healthcare uh, space to come up with this way of generating personalized models, prediction models, right? So, so what we do here is, uh, for example, in this particular example, when we want to predict the uh, onset of type 2 diabetes, right, what we do is we first, using that patient similarity analytics, using a specifically trained uh, distance metric for this particular clinical uh, context to identify the precision cohort for each individual patient, right? And then leveraging that large-scale uh, training platform, we can train a individualized predict model for each patient. Now, since these prediction models are truly individualized, what you get out of this that you don't get from a population-level predictive model is you now get personalized rankings of risk factors. And this is very important because you know, patients are heterogeneous. Uh, in, the, in the case of diabetes, you would very often have you know, patients, two patients both have very high risk of developing diabetes, but it, it's very likely that for one patient, the top risk factor may be obesity, whereas for another patient, the top risk factor, the most important risk factor is uncontrolled hypertension. Right? So building this personalized prediction model will allow you to identify that personalized ranking of risk factors, which makes the result much more actionable because now you're able to not just identify high-risk patients, but you will know for each individual patient how to manage this patient to best avoid that adverse uh, outcome by looking at what is the most important risk factor for that particular patient. So this was uh, work that we uh, published back in 2015. Again, this is a model that we're continuing to enhance. Uh, and I mentioned the large-scale predict modeling platform. Another uh, disease area that we have applied that to is the prediction of uh, onset of heart failure. So heart failure is a very challenging disease to manage, and the outcome is very poor by the time you know, a person is actually diagnosed. So the goal here is to see, can we just let by leveraging routinely collected longitudinal EMR records predict if someone is likely to develop congestive heart failure within a short time horizon, you know, three to 18 months, so that preventive measures can be taken. Um, and so this is a work that we started back in 2012 uh, in collaboration with Geisinger Health Systems. And as you see in this publication we had back in uh, 2012 at AMIA, we showed back then that by leveraging this large-scale predictive modeling framework using this, back then was referred to as big data approach, we were able to significantly outperform the uh, standard models of that time, more you know, off-the-shelf type of prediction models with relatively limited number of risk factors. So that led to a uh, NIH grant, a three-year NIH grant, uh, with additional collaborator, which is uh, Sutter Health, to further enhance these predict models for heart failure, again, still using just routinely collected longitudinal EMR records. Uh, so that, uh, that project was wrapped up at the end of 2016, as, and as you can see here, it led to a series of very interesting insights uh, and publications. Uh, and the last publication coming out of that was uh, in circulation, uh, cardiovascular outcome and, and quality. And one thing I want to point out there is for this publication, uh, we were not only able to show that the feasibility of, of making building predict models for congestive heart failure using routinely collected longitudinal EMR records, but also by leveraging that large scale predict modeling uh, framework and a series of very carefully designed experiments where we're able to share a lot of insights on the impact of different aspects of training the model on the model accuracy. Right? So the different aspects are the quantity and quality of the data, the duration of the, of the, of the data that you collect, and, you know, how, what method to use to extract features, how much domain experts versus you know, purely data-driven methods uh, is used there. Uh, what is the uh, duration of the historical data versus your prediction horizon, et cetera, et cetera, right? So all of these factors, how do they impact your prediction accuracy?
So that provides a lot of very practical insights to institutions as they look to build uh, models in the future to in their practices. Um, and while we look at expanding these, these uh, predict modeling framework to different disease areas, another area that, that we have been working on is to further expand the met methodology to improve the predict model itself. And that includes looking at the use of deep learning. Right? As, uh, you know, we all know as successful as deep learning is, it is not the best method to address all the problems, even for pure prediction. Uh, so what we have been working on is to look at what are some specific ways where deep learning could bring advantage uh, in the specific task that, uh, that we're performing. And one of those areas is in automatic extraction of temporal features. And so this is, uh, in this paper, that was one of the earlier not earliest applications of deep learning to longitudinal EMR records. What we did was to come up with a novel way of mapping from longitudinal EMR records to the convolutional neural network architecture to be able to build a deep learning prediction predict model, but with the purpose of being able to extract temporal features from the longitudinal EMR record in that process. Uh, and we were able to demonstrate that indeed, by doing that you can uh, achieve better prediction accuracy compared to other types of, of predict models because we were able to automatically extract these temporal features. Again, this is one of the earlier attempts at applying deep learning to longitudinal EMR records and we are still looking at different ways of, of, of lever leveraging that. And in this one uh, more recent example, we looked at how to leverage that for, in this case, it's a different predictive task. It's predicting the aggravation of diabetic uh, kidney disease. Uh, so kidney disease is one of the common complications for diabetes. And being able to predict the onset of it, again, helps managing uh, and sometimes delaying the onset of this particular condition. And in this case, what we, this is a work that was carried out by our Tokyo Research Lab. Uh, and using data coming from Fujita Health Systems. Um, and in this particular setting, what turned out to work really well is we used deep learning to, in this particular case, it's autoencoders, to extract, again, temporal features from the longitudinal EMR records. But then, once those features are extracted, we used uh, logistic regression, actually, to, to do the prediction itself of the, of the uh, diabetic kidney disease. Uh, and so this was published last year in Nature uh, Scientific Reports uh, and has many, had a number of very interesting findings. And one thing that I would point out is this last one where we showed that the uh, diabetes kidney disease aggravation group, so that's group of patients with aggravated uh, diabetic kidney disease. Uh, for this group of patients, it not only showed a significantly higher rate of a hemodialysis, which is intuitive because hemodialysis is basically an end stage, what, what you need to do for end stage kidney disease. But it also, uh, that group had higher incidence rates of uh, cardiovascular disease. Right. So this points to, is an example of what I mentioned earlier, is in healthcare setting very often these uh, health risks are associated with each, with each other, right? In this case, you know, diabetes, the, the risk of, of kidney disease aggravation is linked to a uh, higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. So then the question naturally becomes, can we do a better job than just building these isolated risk models, uh, but rather uh, build, develop methods that would allow us to better capture the interconnections between these different conditions to get a more comprehensive view, right? So, this is uh, where we then started looking into multitask learning, right? How do you incorporate multitask learning in building these risk models? And in this early paper uh, published back in uh, KDD in 2015, we developed such a framework for multitask learning in the healthcare space, and we applied this in this case to the use case of uh, management of elderly individuals, right? So elderly patients have many different aspects of risk factors, right? So they have risks that's associated with uh, chronic conditions. They have risks associated with their abilities of carrying out daily activities. 
uh, risks that's associated with their mental capacities. Can they still count money on their own? Uh, risks that's associated with their social activities. Are they getting isolated? Are they still going out, et cetera, right? So we applied uh, this multitask uh, learning framework to this the problem and demonstrated that by building simultaneously predictive models for these different uh, types of risks, we can indeed improve the prediction accuracy as a whole, particularly for the areas where we have fewer numbers of labeled data. So basically by leveraging this multitask learning framework, we can um, borrow, if you will, insights from uh, tasks for which we have more labeled data and use that to improve the performance for the tasks we have fewer training data. And as a byproduct, as you see in the, in the matrix on the lower end, right hand side, in that process, we also uh, uh, can get more insights in terms of the interconnections of these different risks because that's also trained as, as part of the model building process. So more recently, we also applied this multitask learning framework to the prediction of uh, complications of diabetes. I mentioned earlier a model we built for kidney disease in particular. Uh, but there are many, many complications that are common for diabetes patients. And again, these complications tend to be associated with each other. Uh, and to be able to uh, predict which patient is going to likely develop which particular complication next is very useful insights in you know, how to best manage these patients on an individual basis. And so here, we wanted to take the model one step further, meaning not just not just to be able to say the risk of developing a particular complication, but also to be able to predict when that complication is likely to develop. Again, to provide more actionable insights in how to manage that patient. Right? So, so what we did in this case, this was just published last year, is we first designed a very novel data-driven timed event modeling method uh, to be able to predict that timed event, meaning time of the likely development of that complication. Uh, and we demonstrated that it can perform better than the traditional uh, Cox regression type of methods. And then we further combined that uh, rank SVX, which is the time to event model, with multitask learning to be able to leverage the interconnections between different complications to simultaneously predict the complication, these four types of complication, right? So retinopathy, neuropathy, uh, nephropathy, and cardiovascular diseases, four most common complications for diabetes patients. And again, we were able to demonstrate that by doing this, using this multitask learning framework, we can improve the prediction accuracy across these different conditions. All right, so next I'm going to shift gear a little bit and talk about disease progression modeling. So this is where the idea behind this is a lot of these you know, chronic conditions evolve over a long period of time. And very often that evolution is very heterogeneous, meaning different patients seem to take on different symptoms in different order for different durations. And there is, for most conditions, very little understanding of what factor determines which, which patient is going to go on which particular progression pathway. Right. So at the same time, over the years, we now have a lot of longitudinal data collected for many of the disease conditions. And so there's huge opportunity for us to build machine learning models to learn more from that longitudinal data to help us better understand the progression of these different conditions. So what we have done in this space is we built this probabilistic uh, disease progression modeling framework that's basically uh, built on different flavors of hidden Markov models uh, along with different uh, you know, surrounding analytics. Uh, the goal, the, the, what, what this enables us to do is to really learn from data, right, longitudinal data, uh, what are the underlying states behind these observations that we see over time, how to capture, how to characterize these states in terms of conditional uh, probability distributions of different symptoms, and, uh, how to, and, and, and what are the transition probabilities between these different states. Right? And we, this framework also allows us to actually automatically identify the right number of states for each particular condition. And once that model is built, you can also apply that model to individual patients to be able to now better assess where uh, the patient is at, the current state, right? Because now you can assess this state not just based on the current observations, but the whole trajectory of the patient up to date. And, and because of this, this continuous model, you can then also 
have been sizing to not just point in time, but the whole future trajectory of that particular patient. So we first built this uh, uh, model with the use case of modeling the onset of complications for COPD patients. And that's what we published in KDD back in 2014. And since then, we have been continuing to enhance this platform and, and, and applying it to many different disease areas in collaboration with a lot of foundations that does a lot of work in better understanding these disease conditions. So we have been working with CHDI on modeling the progression of Huntington's disease, with JDRF on modeling type 1 diabetes, and more recently with Michael J. Fox Foundation to model the progression of Parkinson's disease. Um, so next I will dive into Huntington's disease a little bit to give you a little more detail of, of, of what these types of models are able to provide. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, just a quick question. When you are measuring the progression, is that again based on the electronic medical record or what are the sources or the types of data points? Yeah, so it's depending on the data that's available uh, actually. So sometimes it's electronic health record, sometimes it's uh, registry data, study data. In the Huntington's disease I'm going to describe, it's actually different studies that have been uh, carried out through the last 10 years or so with data collected. So these are more registry type of data. Okay. But they're all clinical assessments. Okay, that's fascinating. So the, just to be clear, this is all from the provider point of view. Are, is there any patient input? Uh, so far, no. It's all okay. provider data, yeah. so so. <laughs> It's not the limitation of the model, it's the limitation of data. I so agree. far, the, yeah, yeah, the data that we have been given access to, and, I, and for that matter, that have been collected systematically, is, is all provider-centric data, right? It's all clinical data. It's, it's only very recently that patient-generated data and patient-reported outcome is starting to get collected, and hopefully we'll be able to get access to that data sometime down the line, yeah. So, uh, when you say progress and modeling, yeah. It appears that you imply that after a disease has been diagnosed, then only... Uh, Not necessarily. You'll see here we okay. actually have, have uh, uh, again, it's, it's, it's gated by data. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why Huntington's is, is a great uh, disease to study. And I'll get to that. Okay. All right. So for Huntington's disease, that's actually a great segue into, mm. into my next slide. Is it turns out that Huntington's disease is, is a great disease to study, uh, to apply machine learning models to, because uh, first, the Huntington's disease is a single gene disease. So in that, in that aspect, it's a very simple disease, meaning there's very reliable tests that you can apply that you'll know for sure whether this person will develop Huntington's disease or not before symptom onset. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a very, very complex disease in terms of the symptoms. So it has, as you see in the, in the chart up on the right-hand side, it has many multiple aspects of di disease manifestation. There's the motor aspect, there is the cognitive aspect, and there's the functional aspect. Right? So it's a neurodegenerative condition that as the disease progresses, you start to see symptoms in all these three aspects, but as I mentioned earlier, tend to be in different order, in different duration, in different patients. So um, it's a very difficult disease to track and understand uh, from that angle. But because of the fact that it's a single gene disease and because of a very, very active patient community, it's a very <coughs> devastating disease condition. And so there's a very motivated patient community and there have been a lot of registry data collected over the years. So you have very, very good longitudinal data for the, the disease population and a lot of the data actually is collected before the onset of the disease. So it's the asymptomatic stage but because you know these patients will develop Huntington's disease at some point, right? So for this particular disease, unlike a lot of other disease conditions, we have very good data in that we actually have the data for the whole progression, not just after onset, but even before onset. So right? do you have the data for prodromal? Yes, we do, yeah. Uh, so we do have all that data, right? However, um, past efforts in modeling the disease progression using that data tend to be focused on just one aspect of progression at a time and using you know, traditional statistical methods. And that's not surprising because a lot of these traditional statistical models is not able to handle, uh, you know, to address the, the progression of multiple dimensions at the same time. Right? 
So that's where this probabilistic, probabilistic disease regression modeling fr framework really comes in handy because using this model, because each state is captured, uh, characterized by multidimensional conditional probability distribution, we're able to model all these different aspects simultaneously. And the way the model is trained also makes us able to essentially stitch together uh, data coming from all these different studies where each study may focus on a specific stage of the disease uh, progression, but we are able to actually stitch it together to come up with that end-to-end -end model. Okay. And, and so once you have this, this model, what it does for you is, is at the population level, you can this, use this model to identify which clinical factors or measurements are more critical for what particular stage of the disease progression. Uh, so provide insights in you know, uh, disease uh, management programs. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you can apply this model to individuals to get better understanding of the individual progression up to date and uh, also more uh, better assessment of where they are. Right? Now, why are these models useful? Why are all these foundations interested in developing this type of disease progression models? Because they can really impact the outcome of patients in two ways. One is directly uh, uh, applied to clinical decision support to better manage these patients because you have now insights on, again, what clinical measures are more sensitive for what particular stage so that you know what to focus on based on the stage that a patient is at. And also because of the longitudinal nature of the model, you have better understanding of where the patient is at and also where the patient is heading. Right. Another area where these models are applied is to help actually drive development through better clinical trial design. Because these disease progression models, because they capture the natural uh, disease progression, it provides an objective baseline on which you can better evaluate effect of different medications at different stages of, of the progression. You can use this model to, because you can better stage patients, you can then better select patients for a specific trial based on the target of, of that uh, medication uh, and, and what particular stage is more likely to be effective, right? So this notion of uh, trial enrichment. Uh, and then building on that, you can actually build trial simulation models to help drug companies to define uh, you know, for this particular drug, how many patients of what particular type need to be recruited and how long the trial should last, right, in order to have the best chance of actually demonstrating the, the effect of the medication if there is one. So, so again, there's a lot of use for this type of, of, of uh, models. Okay, so in, in the case of Huntington's disease, to answer your question, right, so we trained our model on data that's integrated from four prospective uh, observational studies of Huntington's disease uh, that totals more than uh, 16,000 cases, which is quite significant because Huntington's disease is a rare disease. So it's, it's very uncommon for us to have more than 10,000 uh, data uh, patients to work on. And then uh, the model in the end, again, the, the number of states is automatically determined right through that model selection process. So our approach eventually discovered nine disease states that covers span of four decades of, of disease progression and going from uh, prodromal to transition to manifest stages. As you can see on the right-hand side, that's the uh, transition probability among these different uh, nine states. And because we use continuous time hidden marker model, you can actually compute transition probability for any given time frame. So what you see here is we did it for one year just for illustration, but you can very equally compute it for three months, six months, you know, two years. Um, on the lower left-hand side, what you see is, is, as I mentioned earlier, because the model is able to capture all the different aspects of manifestation at the same time, what it enables is you can then start to see some more complex patterns of progression. Right? So what you see here plotted is uh, on the x-axis are the states, and the space between the states are actually proportional to the expected duration of that state. Right? Because we know the transition probabilities from that, we can compute the expected duration of that particular state. Uh, and then on the y-axis are the different clinical measures. You see three aspects. There are many motor features in the first plot. 
the cognitive features and then functional features. So one very interesting thing, for example, that you see is between state four and five, if you look at motor features, most of them don't have much difference between these two states at all. And same is true with cognitive features. If you look at between state and four, again, no change. But if you look at functional features, you will see between four and five, there's a sharp decline. Right? So this pointed out <coughs> in that transitional phase, at some point, the patients are going to sort of hold steady from the motor side as well as the cognitive side, but have very sharp functional decline right before they become diagnosed with the condition. Right? So again, this is very you know, powerful insights for a lot of clinicians in the field because you know, instead of may seem like patients are very stagnant for a period of time and then there's a sharp decline, but now you, you're able to see if you look beyond motor symptoms, which is the traditional aspect that most clinicians focus on, but look at functional, you may see early signs of a uh, uh, onset of the condition. Yeah. Um, I was so curious, how, how was each of the, um, the state characterized? Uh, so the, this, was, this was characterized after you, uh, you obtained the, the continuous range of the transition probabilities, or did, was this a pretty... So the states are ca characterized by conditional probability distributions yeah. of the different symptoms, right? So the motor symptoms, cognitive yeah. symptoms, functional symptoms, conditional probabilities, meaning if you are in this state, yeah. What is the distribution of these symptoms you're likely to see? Yeah. And then the transition probabilities will tell you the probability yeah. of moving from one state to the next for a given time period of time. Yeah. These two sets of parameters are learned jointly right. um, okay. from data using one learning process, right? So this yeah. is all determined simultaneously. Yeah, but how do you how do you decide uh, how do you decide uh, you want to call a particular uh, learn time or a particular condition as a, or a situation as a state, as a distinct state. Right, so the, what is the, the learning algorithm identifies that automatically. Uh, you just need to specify the number of states. Right? Um, but even that, the number of states, so what the, the whole training process is we test a range of models going from six, uh, a range of number of states. In this particular case, I think we experimented with from six to 12 states. Mm -hmm. right? For each given number of states, the training algorithm will ad identify the optimal uh, state characterization as well as transition probabilities based on the data. And it's measured by likelihood, right? right. And then we can look at, test the, the fitness of these models using a holdout set uh, for each one of these models. And when then we select the model with the highest likelihood. So that's how the model is trained, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, this transition probabilities that you're finding, is it personalized or is it uh, based on like things of that, the, like averaging throughout like yeah. some people? And uh, the other question is that like one of the uh, one of the challenges that I face is uh, when I train a Markov model yeah. on like one person's like activity, and then uh, there's another person that I want to kind of like transfer it from the previous yeah. one. It's hard to like find the solution to find the distance between the two Markov models. Yeah, so, so this Markov model is trained at the population level. So it is the average of the population. The transition probability represents the population average, and so it is not different from patient to patient. However, uh, I don't have details here, but I'd love to talk to you afterwards, is the reason that you can still personalize the model in the sense that even though these are discrete states, uh, if you apply a patient's longitudinal data to the model, you will get posterior probabilities of the patient belonging to any one of these states. And if you look at this posterior probability over time, you will actually see that it captures the continuous progression of the disease, even though we have discrete states. And that posterior probability is different from person to person. So that distribution would allow you to actually personalize the result out of the model. Uh, so the other question I have, uh, so I can see that in the diagonal, uh, they're close to one, which means that uh, it's very probable that the person will stay in that uh, the same yeah. state over yeah. time. Yeah. And uh, the, it, do you think it's like one of the reasons that the temporal, uh, like in, in infinite horizon or finite horizon, in long term, it will not change from one state to another one? That's why the prediction stays the same? Or Right, so, so the low 
probability of moving to the next stage, particularly for the early prodromal phases, is, you know, is linked to, again, the, the expected duration for that state is long. So in the early phases of the disease progression, it's very slow progressing. That's basically what it says. It tends to, you tend to stay in the same state for a long time before you move on to the next state. It's just a very prog slow progression. And, you know, it's the expected, people are expected to stay in that prodromal phase for about 20 years before the disease becomes symptomatic. Yeah. All right? Okay. I know I'm, I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay, so very quickly. Um, I mentioned uh, causal inference earlier, so I just want to give you another example. This is using same set of data, right? These prospective uh, study, um, but another um, uh, use we made out of this data is to use causal inference to give some insights in terms of the effectiveness of the different medications that's given to these Huntington's disease patients. Now, Huntington's disease, just like every neurodegenerative condition, there's no disease-modifying drug that's available right now. Uh, however, doctors do prescribe a lot of medication to the patients to manage the different symptoms because, as you see, there are many, many different symptoms that Huntington's disease patients have. Very often, it's you know, drugs that's initially intended for depression and other type of, of uh, conditions that, that turn out to have some effect on one of these aspects. But there's no guidance out there in terms of what medication is more likely to be effective for which particular symptom. Uh, and basically things are done by trial and error. Right? So what we did here is to, again, leverage this data that we have and we applied, uh, developed a specific causal inference method here that's based on G computation that with uh, hierarchical Bayesian models as post-processing to address some of the challenges in this particular data, meaning there are, you know, these treatment decisions are time varying and the records are at irregular time frames, which is very different from clinical trials, right? And also, there are multiple drugs given at the same time, addressing multiple symptoms. Um, so how do you evaluate the effect in that context, right? So, so the method is, is designed specifically to handle a lot of these challenges, and we were able to demonstrate um, some very interesting findings. For example, tetrabenazine is one of the medications that's very often given to patients to address one particular motor symptom, which is chorea. And uh, our study showed that tetrabenazine is as effective as any other uh, antidepressant drugs for the first year, but for the second year becomes more effective. So again, this pr provides very practical guidance to the, to the physicians in the field. Uh, and very quickly, I touched on the use of these disease progression models for better clinical trial design. Uh, there are obviously many other aspects of trial design, uh, of, of running a clinical trial, uh, going from the design stage to patient recruit recruitment to patient monitoring, all of which actually machine learning can play a role. And we actually had a publication out in Cell last year. Uh, it's a review piece to look at how different machine learning models can be put into use to help with these different stages of trial design. Um, and so we have a lot of effort actually going on in each one of these areas. Two more examples that I want to give, give before I wrap up. One is in the space of, of monitoring, right? So I talked about how machine learning can be used to help us better understand the disease condition. Another area where it can be really powerful is to better monitor the disease condition. And one example I give here is, is to combine, you know, health IoT with machine learning models to better understand monitor Parkinson's disease patients um, so that we can, instead of just relying on, you know, very uh, sparsely scheduled clinical visits to assess a patient, instead to leverage sensors, both bodily sensors as well as environmental sensors, to be able to monitor Parkinson's disease patients in a non-intrusive and also much, much more comprehensive, much, much more uh, realistic way. So the example I gave here in particular is how do you extract from you know, people's normal movements in daily uh, living these motion primitives that's used in coming up with clinical scales to rate uh, Parkinson's disease patients. That's called Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. That's the standard clinical measure. And so to be able to make this machine learning method useful in clinical setting, we need to be able to map the signals from these sensors to actual clinical scales, right? So 
this work is on how do you actually extract these motion primitives, clinically meaningful motion primitives from just regular daily activity uh, movements. One last example is in, has to do with the last pillar, right? So it's about patient engagement, uh, particularly how do we use uh, behavior profiling and analysis to help us uh, come up with more personalized ways of care management. Uh, and the issue we're addressing here is, as we all know, these one-size-fits-all type of care management uh, uh, interventions have very little impact on outcome. And so one step towards personalizing this uh, is to, now that we have a lot of these records of, of uh, care management, can we learn behavior patterns from these records to understand you know, which patients tend to respond better to which particular type of intervention? So this notion of behavior profiling. Um, and what that can help us then is in the field, these models can then help us to uh, understand, number one, for a particular intervention, which are the patients who are more likely to respond to this type of intervention. And by taking that into consideration, you can then start uh, looking at each individual patients based on what they're likely to respond to to set more realistic goals for them uh, so that you're more likely to achieve these goals. So again, this is some work that's still in progress. We had a couple of uh, uh, publications to date where we were able to demonstrate that by uh, you know, applying the models used here are patient similarity combined with causal inference. And we, we were able to show that we can indeed extract these behavior phenotypes and through retrospective <coughs> analysis, we haven't done any prospective analysis here yet, but through retrospective analysis, we're able to show that by making care plans based on these uh, behavior phenotyping driven predictions of likelihood of, atti of attaining these behavior change goals, uh, you can actually come up with plans that can be more effective in attaining these goals. All right? So that's kind of a summary of, of, of at many different levels of our activities. Uh, basically, to summarize, we have um, been able to, uh, you know, we have a lot of examples of successful proof of concepts, if you will, of the feasibility of uh, applying machine learning models to healthcare data to derive uh, useful insights. Uh, but, you know, there are still a lot of challenges, and a lot of opportunities. It's a really great area to be working in. And a lot of our current effort is actually on efforts that are still needed to make these models actually usable in clinical settings, and three particular areas that we're focusing on that we believe are really important to actually make these models deployable, going beyond just proof of concept is, number one, interpretability of the model. How do you make uh, these models more interpretable, therefore more useful? Number two, interoperability and scalability, right? And then number three is meaningful evaluation. I touched upon earlier, how do you evaluate the, the reliability of the model in different settings uh, and, and for different use cases. And again, this is very important for the physicians to make use of these models, right? Just to give you one example, when I'm trying to apply a predictive model in the real world setting for a particular patient, it doesn't help me very much to say this model's AUC is 0.9 even though it's very high AUC, but I don't know if my patient is part of that 90% where the model is accurate versus that 10%, right? So to be able to come up with ways to actually assess for this particular patient how reliable the model is likely to be so that I know how much I can trust the, the outcome of this, uh, this model is actually really important. So that's another area where we're doing a lot of uh, active researching as well. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for a very, very good talk. Uh, covering lots of aspects of these things. Uh, <laughs> if oh, I can ask okay, one question. Okay, that's one question. <laughs> um, so the type of uh, cardiovascular disease that you talked about uh, you didn't mention about like if they are temporal or if the symptoms are showing over time. And the reason that I'm asking is uh, because if, uh, if they're showing over time, you can uh, build the models that can predict and uh, understand the uh, history of a person and then when there's abnormality happening, it can detect it. But if they're temporal, meaning that 
like uh, once in a while they show some they show some symptoms. It's hard to detect them. So what kind of uh, diseases did you look at? So heart failure is one, and we actually just started a collaboration with Broad Institute last year to now incorporate genomic information into the picture as well. And for that, we're looking at predicting uh, heart attack, um, sudden cardiac death, and uh, atrial fibrillation. Those are the heart conditions that we're looking at. So recently, I was discussing with some of my friends in this area, and uh, one thing that came up was that uh, using the wearable devices and all this data, yeah. we can start tracking and understanding much better before these things Symptom we, we start onset. checking yeah. this. Yeah. And there is uh, some work being done in that area, but not much to really start identifying these things in yeah. really advance. Yeah. So, so a big challenge there is, is, as you pointed out, it's difficult to have reliable data for the <coughs> pre-symptomatic stage. Yeah. That prodromal phase is, is where data is difficult to come by. Um, and that's why I, I mentioned a lot for Huntington's disease, it's actually an ideal case because we have a lot of data. For others, it's hard. Um, but I think, for example, all of us, mm. research efforts should help there. Uh, to the, the thing is to be able to get people motivated enough to start report data regularly even before they are sick. Right. So. And what quick oh, general question. Oh. Yeah. So in the future, how are you going to use these models to uh, make a personalized uh, you know, healthcare impact? Or oh, who will be using this? Is it going to be the hospital, clinic, IBM, or? Who's going to use you. these uh, models? <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. personal, you can just... Really, I, I think the future of health a lot, right? I mean, Ramesh and I were just discussing that. It's about empowering the individual to, to be really the custodian of your own health. Uh, so you now, there's a lot of hurdles. App on your uh, cell phone, too. So I talked about the computational challenges, and, and that's where, you know, I know how to do things. But obviously, a lot of challenge there is beyond computational, right? It's system, it's, it's uh, the different, um, you know, payer, provider, and pharma interactions, and, and what's going to emerge out of this system to become the driver of... I think the general trend is undeniable that individuals are going to become, you know, empowered to be the custodian of their own health. The question is, exactly like you said, who is going to provide that service? Is it providers? Is it payers? Is it pharma companies? Is it some new entity that's emerging from the system? And I think that's still yet to be figured out. Thank you very much.